the classic study, which we'll talk about, which to me should change the entire approach to treating diabetes, it's called the EDIC study. And in the EDIC study, what we did is we used triple therapy right from the beginning. And my, my, my point of the Banting lecture, the ominous octet, if you have eight problems, why in the world do you think one drug's gonna correct eight problems? It ain't gonna happen in our lifetime. So the point was you need to use drugs in combination. So we said, we're gonna use what, what we think are the best drugs at the time. So we started with metformin, with exenatide, <laughs> an old time GLP-1. This is not the kingpin. This you know. is the pre-liraglutide. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what was available. That drug was useless, wasn't it? No, it's a good drug. Really? Okay. Sure, it's not semaglutide. Yeah, or okay. that. But you have to start yeah, somewhere, no, no, right? It, it, yeah, let's, let's pay it its dues as being the Gen 1 OG version of that drug. Without exactly. which we might not have... We wouldn't, we wouldn't have semaglutide or tizepatide. Yes. Yep. So it's kind of an old timer. Yep. And, and pioglitazone, that was the triple therapy, okay? Uh, and then uh, we said, every diabetic patient, there are 315 people in this study. They're having insulin clamps, hyperglycemic clamps, muscle biopsies. No one in the world can do this study. 315 people, follow up for six years, okay? So we said, this is what we believe is the appropriate therapy. And then we said, we'll use the ADA approach. The ADA approach is you start on metformin, okay? And when you fail, even though I explicitly said, the next drug that's used is sulfonylureas. And then the third drug that's added is insulin. And we said uh, that the goal of therapy was an A1C of six and a half, six years later, okay? <laughs> 29% of the people with the ADA approach have failed. Their A1C is above six and a half. Six years later with our approach, 70% of the people have an A1C that's less than six and a half. Why? Insulin clamp, huge improvement with our therapy. Okay, this is the EDIC study. The, the three-year data are published, the six-year data, we're writing it up. How much improvement in insulin sensitivity with the ADA approach? Zero. Beta cell function. You have almost a normal beta cell. Ralph, why the disconnect? Between well, where? Between between what you're seeing in the edict study and what the ADA is promoting. Uh, <laughs> you have to ask the ADA. What's their answer? If if I'm a patient, and I'm and I, or if I'm a physician who's treating these patients, and I'm saying, guys, I'm confused. I'm looking at the literature. I'm seeing this. I'm looking yeah. at your. And by the way, I see this with the AHA and cardiovascular yeah. guidance. So I'm not yeah. singling out you or yeah. or but but. Like, is this simply a question of the pace at which medicine moves is so glacial? That's part of it. Plus, remember, if to do 315 people, follow them for 16 years, and do all the stuff we did, it's unequivocal. And why has there not been political pressure? Because the cost of insulin is enormous, and well, your approach is going to be less expensive. They finally said in 2022, this is a statement, the, the ADA approach is not based on pathophysiology. I, I, I view myself as a scientist, okay, as well as a clinician. Uh, as a good clinician, I've taken care of hundreds of thousands of patients, and I've done I, I, 850 publications. Uh, I do clinical research. I work in people. When I do an insulin clamp study, and I see an improvement in insulin sensitivity, I do a hyperglycemic clamp, and I see in 315 people your base cell function, I don't need 5,000 people. I yeah. don't need... I can't do this study in 5,000 people. No one can do this study. But the 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 tools that we're using are so powerful. Look, if I normalize your insulin sensitivity and I give you a normal beta cell and your A1C is less than six and a half and it's, well, it's half of the half of the 315 people, why you not think that's the best therapy, okay? And now on the other side, I have this metformin SU insulin and that 71% of the people have failed. There's zero improvement in insulin sensitivity, zero improvement in beta cell function. Why you think that's such a good regimen? And now, above and beyond all that, I didn't do this study. This is the GRADE study, G-R-A-D-E. It's sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And what the GRADE study said is, uh, and I have to say, this is the third study that's shown what I'm gonna tell you. Dr. Robert Turner's United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study showed this uh, in uh, year uh, 1990. Uh, Stephen Karn showed this in the ADOPT study in year 2005, and now we have the GRADE study, 2020. I call this the 15-year revolution, revelation. 
<laughs> we saw what didn't work 1990. <laughs> oh, Stephen Kahn did it again. Oh, it didn't work in 2005. And now 2020, NIH did it. You know what? All show the same thing. And this was a sequential approach. You had to fail on metformin to get into the study. Okay, so you failed in metformin, then you enter the study, then we go single agent. I can, they, they wanted to know what's the best next drug to add to metformin. I can add a sulfonylurea. A1C went down in year one, up straight. I can add. D tell folks how a sulfonylurea works. Uh, sulfonylureas uh, are old time drugs. They bind to the sulfonylurea receptor on the beta cell and they kick out insulin. Mm -hmm. And they're very good drugs in the first year. And then they burn out the pancreas. Uh, uh, well, they stop working. Yeah, I mean, basically, they they kick the can down the road without addressing the pathophysiology. It, that I like that way. Yes. yes. Then other drug, DPP four inhibitor. Tell people how those work. Yep. Uh, so a DPP four inhibitor increases your GLP one and your GIP level uh, endogenously. It, it makes your gastrointestinal cells, the K and the L cells, that secrete the GLP one and GIP, makes them make more GLP one and mm -hmm. GIP. But it, it doesn't increase the GLP-1 and GIP enough to really give you a knockout punch. I give you an injection, you all, people are out there, of Monjaro or semaglutide, that's the knockout punch, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, when I give you the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, they, yeah, they, they do increase GLP-1 and GIP a little bit, but not powerful enough to give you a long lasting effect. So first year, A1C comes down, A1C goes up. Uh, third drug, that this was very surprising to me. This was liraglutide. This is one of the earlier GLP-1 receptor Gen agonists. Gen 2. Yeah, I, I thought that was gonna work the best. It failed. It worked in the first year and then failed. And then the fourth drug was insulin. And the, the docs just didn't titrate the insulin enough. So A1C down and then they failed. So five years later, all four of those regimens added to metformin failed. Triple therapy, exenatide, an old time GLP-1. Peolidazone, which people don't appreciate, the only true insulin sensitizer and metformin. Six years later, you're 70% of the people have an A1C less than seven. And, and, and let's just go back. Metformin is free. The Gen 1... Uh, exenatide. Exenatide is basically free. It's basically free now. Peolidazone is $5 a month. Okay, so we have three free drugs that work better. Correct. Now it's interesting, when you talk about today's triple therapy, which is way more efficacious, Different two of those three drugs are very expensive. Yes. The SGLT2 inhibitors are very expensive, and the modern day Gen 3, Gen 4, and soon we'll have a Gen 5 yeah. GLP-1, they're very pricey. They're very, $1,000 a month for the, yep. uh, yeah. Now, are they great drugs? So the question of is- Of course. <laughs> yeah, is, but, but I, I guess the question is, do, they, do you need to be on those drugs if your old version of triple therapy. Uh, our old version is incredibly effective. The problem is you can't get people to use peoglitazone. And the reason is the patients are frustrated with the fact that they're retaining water? Uh, no, more that they, they weigh, gain weight. How much weight do they gain typically? How many kilos? Depends on the dose. I, like I don't go to the 45 milligram dose. So at the end of the year, they may gain two or two and a half kilos at the 15 and 30 milligram uh, dose, okay? If you give PO plus a modern day GLP-1, uh, don't we've you done offset this. the weight you gain? You cannot believe, oh, you lose all the weight you go, lose with the GLP-1 receptor. So if a patient is willing to go down the path of a modern day GLP, P1, That's doesn't my treatment. that completely eliminate? Absolutely. And it also gets rid of the edema. Yeah. And believe me, their A1Cs are down in the normal range. A person shows up with um, a hemoglobin A1C of nine and a half percent. Yeah. This is a person who hasn't come to medical attention soon enough. And I'm going to give you the answer definitively, but I'm going to let you ask the question. You're happy if they only go from nine and a half percent to seven percent. If they only had a two and a half percent drop, you but wouldn't try to get them down to six percent. I would, and we've done the study. Okay. I see, what drives me is science. If you understand pathophysiology and there's an abnormality, and you correct the abnormality, things get better. Okay. So in the Qatar study, uh, and there are uh, two hundred and twenty people or so in the study. To get into the Qatar study, you had to be poorly controlled on metformin sulfonylurea. So you had to have failed on this. And the average A1C was about 10. Uh, and uh, about a third of these people were symptomatic, meaning they had polyuria, polydipsia, they were losing weight. 
And so the, the current concept is in those people, you would put them on a mixed split insulin regimen. You would get rid of the glucotoxicity. You get rid of the lipotoxicity and uh, you get their A1C down to six and a half. And then now you can put them back on the oral medications or whatever. And now they respond because you got rid of the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity. We said, well, that may or may not be true. So we said, well, half of these people are starting with an A1C above 10. Uh, we'll go on uh, a mixed split insulin regimen, okay? With a large gene and a rapid acting insulin. And the other half are gonna go on that old dude, exenatide and peoglitazone, the one that people don't like to use, okay? Three years later, the A1C in the group with the mixed split insulin regimen is 7.1%. Uh, and we're very good at insulin. But why couldn't we go lower? Because we got into trouble with hypoglycemia. Okay, the A1C in the group <laughs> treated with exenatide and peoglitazone is 6.1. And so th then we said, okay, look, uh, we'll, we'll, look, we'll do a subgroup analysis. And so about one third of the people were, we'll, we'll just look at the people who are symptomatic. The starting A1C is 12.2. <laughs> Three years later, their A1C is 6.1. How long? 6.1. Three years From later. From 12? Yeah. 12.2 symptomatic. On which combination? Xenotide and peoglitazone. Without even metformin. Uh, without, they had failed on oh, metformin and SU met. to get into the study, okay? So what we're saying, look, if you have drugs that correct the insulin resistance, that's peoglitazone. Again, Ralph, this is almost impossible for me to imagine. I can send you all the papers. It's but, all published. But I just, you know, I just, I hope every single family medicine internist, everyone who ever takes care of somebody with diabetes is listening. I hope so too. Because you're basically saying we can take these two old cheap drugs and take someone from the most brittle type two diabetes. I mean, a hemoglobin A1C of 12, Very you're, bad. you're knocking on death's door. Correct. You're gonna go blind. Yep. You're gonna have your toes amputated. You're not ever going to have an erection again. And you're going to die of cardiovascular disease or kidney disease or Alzheimer's disease quickly. These numbers that I'm telling you, they're right from the paper and it's a large, it's over 200 people. And in a couple of years on two old cheap drugs, yep. you're normal. Yep. And what's better, what makes these studies so solid is we have very sophisticated pathophysiologic measurements. No one can do what we do. So, so the <laughs> only people, pushback we, is those patients are going to have to gain a couple of kilograms of but but of course if if you're willing to now spend a bit more money and switch them from gen 1 to gen 3 oh, yeah. or gen 4 GLP1 agonist and GIP then all of a sudden you ameliorate that and you get all the benefits this becomes a non issue if, if, if put cost aside